Morning, everyone. It's good to see you all. As Kenny said, uh, my name is Stephen, and let me also add my welcome. Um, today is the third and final uh, sermon in a three-part mini-sermon series called Post-Pandemic Me. And I want to emphasize it's post-pandemic me. So why are we social distancing? I know it's a long weekend. I'm wondering if it's going to be extra. To, for, like some of the people, like Ditiro, can you come, can you come closer? I need, I need some people, like Wesley's not here today, so I need people who are going to say amen and... I need to feel the presence. Come, guys. Um, at the back there, Kat. Kat and Bunganik. Oh, you saw Bona. Okay, okay, I see you. Um, oh, yeah, saw Bona's over. Guys, please come a bit closer. The folks there. Is that Sipo sitting there? Please come a bit closer, guys. Thanks, Leo. Thanks. Thanks, my family members must also come closer, please. There's space in the front. Jono says there's space in the front. Um, no social distancing anymore. Thanks, guys. That's much better. It feels much more intimate. <laughs> the, pa the pandemic clearly has left a lasting effect, and we still do social distancing. And that's what we've been reflecting on these last few weeks, um, is on the impact of the pandemic, how it changed the world, and how it changed all of us. And we're trying to recalibrate and realign in, in light of God's word um, to how we should be living now. Um, the pandemic did cause many of us to stop and reevaluate life, um, whether it's our priorities, our relationships, our work, uh, even our church involvements. And to be honest, some people never made it back to church. Uh, but all of us, I think, we kind of thought about it all again. Certainly, none of us were ready for the pandemic not as individuals, as the church. We weren't ready. It was quite a major shock to the system as we had to pivot for how do we do things virtually. Our public health systems were not ready for the pandemic. Uh, Bill Gates may have warned us about this in a TED talk that, that went viral uh, at, the, at the time of the pandemic. I don't know if you remember that one. Um, a few years before, he warned us there's a danger of pandemics, but nevertheless, the world was not ready. And as we now emerge from the pandemic, a question that many people are asking is, are we ready for the next pandemic? I don't know if you saw the news recently, the World Health Organization are busy trying to negotiate a global treaty to ensure that the world is much more prepared and ready for the next pandemic. Uh, so are you, are you ready for the next pandemic? <laughs> Have you stocked up on toilet paper already? <laughs> Have you finalized your position on vaccines? You, you've been warned. But some people are saying that the, the pandemic was really just a wake-up call for other more serious disasters that are on the way, uh, like climate change. Are you ready for that? Uh, are you ready for nuclear war? The situation in Ukraine is a serious one. Are you ready for AI? It's going to change everything, right? What about water scarcity? Some people have been saying that World War III is going to be fought over water. Have you got your JoJo tanks installed? Just like Bill Gates gave his TED talk about pandemics a few years ago, I'm sure there's tons of TED talks about climate change, about water scarcity, about nuclear uh, war and nuclear holocausts. So we've been warned. Uh, the question is, are we ready? One response to the pandemic clearly is to start worrying more about all these things, to try to control the situation, or to try to, to try at least to take control of our lives, to have backup plans in place, to have enough savings. Uh, but we've been seeing over the last two weeks that uh, Jesus teaches us not to fear and not to worry. And so today we're going to continue to look at what the Bible says we really do need to be ready for and how to be ready. What do we really need to be ready for? And how do we ensure that we're ready? So turn with me, if you have a Bible, to Luke chapter 12, as we continue where we left off last week. Luke chapter 12. And um, it's going to be up behind me. But if you do have a Bible, it'd be great to keep it open, because it's quite a long text. And I want us to kind of see it as a whole, not get too lost in the details, but keep the sense of, of how it all fits together. Just some context before we start reading. Jesus here in Luke 12, he's in the middle of a sermon 
He's preaching a sermon, and I want you to picture the scene. There are crowds all around him. Luke tells us that they are, the crowds are trampling on each other. So they are pushing up against him. There's a big crowd. And as Jesus is preaching the sermon, at times he's addressing, to the, whole, he's addressing the whole crowd, and at other times he turns aside to his disciples and he gives them a kind of an inside uh, story. And I've got one of those red letter Bibles. I'm not saying that everyone should have a red letter Bible by any means, but I do have one at home. In fact, I think it's my wife's. Uh, but in this, in this passage, because Jesus is speaking virtually the whole time, it's kind of all red. And so it's easy to see those little bits which are in black uh, where Luke says things like, and then he turned to the crowd, and then he turned to his disciples, then speaking to the crowd. So you kind of see uh, through this whole sermon how he, how he jumps between addressing the crowd and his disciples. And it's worth kind of bearing in mind who he's speaking to as we think about how it applies. So let's pick it up in Luke chapter 12, verse 31. At this point, he's speaking to his disciples. And so read with me from Luke chapter 12, and we start in verse 31, which is just a recap of where we left off the first few verses we covered last week, but this is where Jesus makes the big point of his sermon. He says, but seek his kingdom, and these things will be provided for you. Don't be afraid, little flock, because your father delights to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Make money bags for yourselves that won't grow old. An inexhaustible treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And now turning to today's passage, verse 35. Be ready for service and have your lamps lit. You are to be like people waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can open the door for him at once. Blessed will be those servants the master finds alert when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will get ready, have them recline at the table, then come and serve them. If he comes in the middle of the night or even near the dawn and finds them alert, blessed are those servants." But know this, if the homeowner had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also be ready, because the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Lord, Peter asked, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? The Lord said, Who then is the faithful and sensible manager his master will put in charge of his household servants to give them their allotted food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom the master finds doing his job when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that servant says in his heart, my master is delayed, he is delaying his coming, and starts to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk, that servant's master will come on a day he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unfaithful. And that servant who knew his master's will and didn't prepare himself or do it will be severely beaten. But the one who did not know and did what deserved punishment will receive a light beating. From everyone who has been given much, much will be required, and from the one who has been entrusted with much, even more will be expected. I came to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already set ablaze. But I have a baptism to undergo, and how it consumes me until it is finished. Do you think that I came here to bring peace on earth. No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He also, said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, right away you say, 
A storm is coming, and so it does. And when the south wind is blowing, you say, it's going to be hot, and it is. Hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky, but why don't you know how to interpret this time? Why don't you judge for yourselves what is right? As you are going with your adversary to the ruler, make an effort to settle with him on the way. Then he won't drag you before the judge. The judge hand you over to the bailiff, and the bailiff throw you into prison. I tell you, you will never get out of there until you have paid the last penny. At that time, some people came and reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And he responded to them, do you think that these Galileans were more sinful than all the other Galileans because they suffered these things? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as well. Or those 18 that the tower in Siloam fell on and killed, do you think they were more sinful than all the other people who live in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as well. Let's pray and ask God to help us as we unpack this, this passage. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you do speak to us through your word. And we ask, Holy Spirit, now that you would be at work in us, applying it to our lives, helping us to understand. Uh, would you give us today the assurance of the things that we should hope in? And would you give us certainty about things that we do not yet see? Lord, help us all to respond with faith and to respond with faithfulness in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we left off last week with the part where Jesus summarized the, the main point of his entire sermon. And the main point was this. Do not worry about material things, but seek first the kingdom and build up treasures in heaven. That was the big point. And John did a great job of challenging us as we, pan as we emerge uh, out of the pandemic, not to double down on looking after number one, not to make sure we have enough savings or, con or control of our lives, but rather to be generous towards God, to be generous with our time, with our talents, with our treasures, and in that way, to build up treasures in heaven. So spoiler alert, that's the big point of the whole sermon. Seek his kingdom or treasure the kingdom. That's the big point. And in today's section, we're going we're gonna to see Jesus teaching on how it is that we are to seek the kingdom. How are we to build up treasures in heaven? What will it look like in this time period that we're living in now if we are investing in the kingdom? What are the implications of seeking the kingdom? And Jesus is going to use various illustrations and parables to teach us how to seek the kingdom and to describe what storing up treasures in heaven will look like. And in the first parable, we see the first how. And the first how is that we need to be ready. We need to be ready. Jesus starts it by saying, be ready for service and have your lamps lit. The literal translation of that ready for service is let your loins be girded, which is kind of an idiom for tying up your clothes. In those days, perhaps people wore cloaks and gowns and robes. And so if you wanted to walk or run, you had to tie it all up so, so that you could. Um, so that, that's what it meant. A other translations say, be dressed ready for action. And the picture Jesus is busy creating in this parable is of servants who are waiting up late at night for their master to return from a wedding. And we can imagine that as the night goes on, they might be tempted to get tired they might fall asleep. Maybe they'll start uh, playing games or entertaining themselves while they wait. But there's a repeated emphasis in the passage on being ready, being alert. They have to be ready so that they can open the door for him at once. It could be a long wait, but it's definitely worth it because Jesus says there's a reward. Did you see what the reward is? When the servant comes, so when the master comes, he will reward them in this way, it says, blessed will be those servants the master finds alert when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he, the master, will get ready. Literally, the, it's the same word. He will gird his loins and have them recline at the table, then come and serve them. So there's like a role reversal where faithful servants waiting ready 
will end up uh, enjoying the master serving them and eating and feasting with them. And I can't help at this point being reminded of our recent sermon series on eating with Jesus. Uh, because we saw also in the Gospel of Luke how often Jesus was at the table, how often he was feasting with people, um, enjoying or letting people enjoy intimacy with him. I think of verses like in Psalm 23, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Or Revelation 3.20, where Jesus says, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will open and let me in, I will come in and dine with him. And so there is a reward for being ready to open for Jesus. It involves feasting and intimacy with the master. And the second illustration that Jesus very quickly and seamlessly pivots to is that of a thief breaking in to the house. He says, if the homeowner had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. So what's the point of this illustration? Is it that the homeowner should somehow have predicted the time that the thief was gonna come? Obviously not. Uh, the point is that he, he should have been ready throughout the night. Should have been ready at every point in case that was the time when the thief came. And then Jesus drives the point home by applying it to his disciples. He says, so you also be ready because the son of man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And by now, you, because we, we've maybe been in church for a while, um, you may have figured out that when Jesus says the son of man, he's referring to himself. Already in Luke, he's been revealing himself as the son of man, referring to himself in that way. But let's not move on from that too fast because what, that is a massive title that Jesus is applying to himself. It is no small thing to refer to himself as the son of man, especially to his original audience. So to appreciate what it would have meant, the impact of it, let's have a quick look at Daniel chapter seven in the Old Testament, where we, we see Daniel, he's busy ex explaining and describing a vision, a prophetic vision of many kingdoms on the earth coming and going. And then we will see the appearance of the son of man. We pick it up in Daniel chapter seven, verse 12. He says, as for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was removed, but an extension of life was granted to them for a certain period of time. I think these beasts he's talking about are kingdoms that come, earthly kingdoms. And it's interesting that there's some sort of extension of, of a period of time in which they, they don't really have dominion, but there's still an extended period of, of life. And as Daniel continues describing the vision, he says, I continued in the night visions, and suddenly, suddenly, one like a son of man was coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days, that's God. He approached the ancient of days and was escorted before him. He was given dominion and glory and a kingdom so that those of every people, nation and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. Yeah. Jumping ahead a few verses to verse 18, we read, but the holy ones of the Most High will receive the kingdom and possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. So this claim to be the son of man is a very bold claim. But it's also a confusing claim for the disciples because if he was the son of man, then why weren't they seeing him arriving on the clouds to bring judgment, to destroy his enemies, to establish the kingdom? Perhaps many of us don't share their confusion because we, it's been 2,000 years, we know Jesus came, we know he's coming again, so we're kind of not sharing their confusion, but remember, they're seeing this unfold in real time. And so, Jesus has to help them a little bit by kind of explaining some of the timelines. And he does this in verse 49 and 50 of Luke 12. Have a look with me there, what he says. Verse 49, he says, I came to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already set ablaze. But I have a baptism to undergo, and how it consumes me until it is finished. These verses are a little tricky to understand, but I think what Jesus is saying is that he is the son of man and he will bring the fire of judgment. And in a way he wishes it was already here. 
partly because it's going to be a great day where justice is done, yeah. peace on earth yeah. is established forever, but partly he wishes it was already there because of what still has to happen. He says, I have a baptism to undergo and how it consumes me until it is finished. Another translation says, how it distresses me until it is accomplished. Jesus is talking about his impending death on the cross. Because at this very moment, Jesus is traveling to Jerusalem and he's preaching in the towns as he goes. He's traveling to Jerusalem knowing that that is where he's going to die. In fact, not only knowing that he's going to die, but fully intending to go there for that very purpose. We know this because just a few chapters earlier in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, Luke writes, when the days were coming to a close for him to be taken up, he determined to journey to Jerusalem. The literal translation of that determined to journey is he stiffened his face to go to Jerusalem. You know that look of determination? It's as if Jesus looks in the direction of Jerusalem knowing what he's going there for and kind of grimaces but faces it, deciding that he's going for it. Jesus knew that before he can come as the Son of Man in judgment to bring uh, his kingdom, he would have to first be the suffering servant, which is also prophesied about, also messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. Before he could come as the Son of Man, he has to first fulfill his role as the suffering servant to execute God's rescue plan to save people from that coming judgment. So despite these confusing timelines, Jesus wants his followers to know for sure that he is the Son of Man, that he will establish his kingdom, that it will be an everlasting kingdom greater than any other kingdom, and that his faithful servants can look forward to their treasures in heaven one day. He wants them to be sure of it. He doesn't want them to miss it. He wants them to be ready. Yeah. Might take a while, but he wants them to stay alert and ready. After these first illustrations in our passage, Peter then asks a question, and we always enjoy it when Peter asks a question. It always gets a little bit controversial and he ends up looking a bit silly. In this case, Peter asks him, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? Now, it's not clear exactly why Peter's asking this question, but knowing him, it might be because Jesus has been speaking about rewards. And so he's wondering, like, is it coming, is it, are we the ones who are gonna get this reward? Or is it also the crowd that you're not dressing right now? And of course, Jesus doesn't give Peter a nice answer. He doesn't say, yes, Peter, it's you. He starts off by rephrasing the question. He says, who then is the faithful and sensible manager his master will put in charge? At this point, I wonder if Peter's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just tell me, is it us? Like, who is it? I, who is it? Is it, is it us? And remember, Jesus is speaking on the side to his disciples. So, you know, maybe they would, can be forgiven for wondering if they have a special place in the kingdom. They're in the inner circle. But Jesus' answer is not as simple as, yes, Peter, it's you, or it's also the crowd. Um, he gives Peter more of a choose-your-own-adventure type of answer. Did any of, you, did any of you read those choose-your-own-adventure books growing up? You know those ones. I, 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 got, I found out last night from a member of a, of a younger generation uh, that Netflix has a version of this, apparently. You can choose your own adventure in a, in a, in a movie type situation. I mean, you know how it works, those books. It's like you're reading and, and it's like you're walking down a dark alley and the next thing is a cloaked villain jumps out and attacks you, what do you do? Option A, you turn and run for your life. Option B, you see a nearby baseball bat and you decide to fight. If you pick option A, turn to page 12. If you pick option B, turn to page 21. All right, you know that, that, those stories. So you're in the story and you choose who you're gonna be and what you're gonna do. And Jesus gives Peter four choose your own adventure options here. And only one of them is a happy ending. He gives Peter four types of servants and only one of them is the faithful servant. The faithful servant Jesus describes this way, he says, Blessed is that servant whom the master finds doing his job when he comes. We've already seen that J Jesus says we must be ready and alert as we patiently wait for the coming of the Son of Man. And here we see that waiting is not a passive thing. We don't wait passively. Here we see it is an, it is an active waiting. When the master comes, 
at an unexpected time, will he find us doing our job? And what is that job? Well, in the passage, we read that it is serving in the master's household, giving the other servants their food at their proper time. So for us, this means serving faithfully in God's household, which is the church, serving and feeding each other. In Ephesians 2, it says, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So God's household is the church. And so post-pandemic Christian, if the son of man were to come today, would he find you doing your job? Have you fully recommitted to serving actively in his household, which is the church? I must admit, for me personally, it was quite an adjustment going back after the pandemic, after lockdowns, going back to in-person church, especially when we moved back here to New Hope. Uh, when I was in the band, it was back to 7.30 till 12 on a Sunday morning, and coming out of lockdown, that was a lot. Um, and, and to be honest, I, I'm still figuring it out in, in life, life post the pandemic with busyness. I'm, I'm still figuring it out because I think the pandemic did rightly cause us to pause and reflect and reevaluate how busy we'd become and what we were committed to. Um, and, you know, and I am learning to say no to things in life. It's not easy. Um, not so much no to things at church, but in life in general. Um, and so, yeah, I'm also trying to still wrestle with like, what are the lessons from the pandemic for me in my life uh, as, as I prioritize and, and preparing for the sermon and listening to the series so far, I think has been a useful time of reflecting and thinking about it, but thinking about it through the lens of scripture because we have to reevaluate our lives not through post-pandemic culture, but through the scripture. We have to have the help of the Holy Spirit to apply it to us because our, our situations are different. And, and so we need the Spirit to apply the word appropriately in our lives. And in the light of the word in front of us today, we have to ask the question, have we fully recommitted to serving actively in the master's household, which is the church? Sometimes we call serving in God's household, we call it ministry, sometimes. Uh, and ministry is not reserved for those people who are paid to work uh, for the church as a full-time job. It's not just reserved for, for John o, who's our congregational pastor, or for our lead pastor, Oni Mokhatle, who, who Kenny forgot to mention when he said he, he, he said he serves. He has the privilege of serving alongside Pastor Stephen and Pastor John, I forgot to mention our lead pastor, Pastor, on, pastor Oni. I don't know how many people noticed that. Um, they have been for a while and, and have been away for a little while taking a break, and we do look forward to having them back next week. Um, but it's not just the people who, who are on staff. It's not just the pastors who are doing ministry. Uh, ministry is simply followers of Jesus helping each other follow Jesus better. It's, it's just helping each other follow Jesus. Whether that's through explaining the gospel to someone for the first time, calling them to follow Jesus, or whether that's reading the Bible with someone, teaching each other, discipling each other. Uh, it could be praying for someone. It could be serving coffee, serving in, in any of the departments. It could be giving meals to people when they're in, going through a time of need. It could be simply rocking up at a midweek family group, even though you're tired and stressed and don't really think you're gonna get much out of it yourself, but being there so that other people can rely on there being a space for them to come and be encouraged and fed. So ministry is something that all of us can do and should do. You see, the faithful servant in this parable is not just Peter. Probably it did turn out to be Peter much later on uh, in his life after many lessons, hard lessons. Uh, it's not just a special category of Christian or people on, on church staff. It can be any of us if we faithfully do the work God has entrusted to us, using the time, the talents, the treasures that we have. But unfortunately, not all the servants in this parable are faithful. We see three unfaithful servants, three of them. There's a malicious servant, there's a negligent servant, and an ignorant servant. A malicious servant, a negligent servant, and an ignorant servant. The malicious servant is by far the worst. He ends up beating his fellow servants, even the female servants. 
He lives the good life, eating, drinking, getting drunk. Now, this could refer to people who use their position in the church uh, for the wrong reasons, for their own financial gain, for their power, their status, um, to live the good life themselves. And in the process, they fail to look after those under their care. But worse than that, they actually harm those under their care. They abuse them and harm them. And the punishment for this type of servant is extremely severe. It says that that master servant will come on a day he does not expect him, and at an hour he does not know, he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unfaithful. This is an extremely serious warning to Christian leaders who might forget that they are merely looking after God's household in the meantime until his very soon return. And yes, this probably does apply to malicious Christian celebrities out there in bad churches teaching false doctrines. I'm sure it does. But what about us here at Rooted Fellowship? Let's heed this warning before we even start down this sort of a road. So for myself and others as elders of Rooted Fellowship, for the deacons, for family group leaders, those serving in different departments, Don't be tempted to see those spaces as your own. Don't be tempted to use those spaces to elevate your own status. Instead of loving and serving those around you humbly, being grateful for the opportunity that we have. I'm I'm very glad to say that literally preparing for this, there's no one in my mind that I'm thinking that could be the malicious servant (laughs) in Newton. So so don't get me wrong, I'm extremely grateful for for all of you that serve in so many different departments. Um, For the Mokhatles, who 10 years ago, I think, roughly towards the end of 2013, they started taking steps of obedience towards planning and preparing for planting rooted fellowship. Super grateful. Super grateful for our congregational pastor, Jono, who does an amazing job of looking after us, of shepherding all the groups, all the discipleship. He does an incredible job. Thankful for all of you, all the people serving in the different ministries, that we really do have incredible people serving. And so I'm very confident that we have some faithful servants, a lot of faithful servants in our midst. Um, So let me apply the malicious servant thing to myself because, because I think it applies to me. I think I'm tempted, and not not only tempted, sometimes I sin in the area, maybe as an elder, maybe it's in that area, or being in the band, where I get get offended by things, or upset, I feel maybe cut out of something, or I didn't this, or that, like, and it's very tempting to sort of feel like I want to hold on to those things. I think the application for me is to hold lightly to those things, to, to just be grateful that there's an opportunity to steward something but not to hold on to or to want to grasp onto those things. And I think that sometimes if you, and and this may apply to you in a different ministry, maybe it's in the coffee team you're working in or in the sound team, there's gonna be moments where you get offended, where you get upset, where you find yourself emotional. And I think it's worth reflecting on yourself and being like, hang on, that's a red flag of something in me. It's not someone else who necessarily said something. It's how it landed in my heart. So I think we need to just be careful um, that we really don't take these things and grasp them for ourselves. And let's not miss where it started going wrong for the malicious servant. He said in his heart, it all started when he said in his heart, my master is delaying his coming. See, he lost sight of the big point Jesus is making here, that we must be ready for the coming son of man that we must faithfully serve in his household in light of his soon return. Because if we know he's coming tomorrow, we're not gonna try to use Rooted Fellowship for our own gain. If he's coming tomorrow, we're gonna be super faithful. So fellow, fellow believer, let's never become like this malicious servant. And the next unfaithful servant we see here is negligent. He's negligent. He knows his master's will, but he doesn't prepare himself, nor does he do it. And I wonder why not. Why doesn't he do it? Perhaps he was distracted by worrying about tomorrow or by obsessing over the things of this world. Maybe he was too busy living his best life. Perhaps he too said in his heart, my master is delayed in his coming. It's not, it's not urgent. And he just never got around to being obedient. 
the negligent servant doesn't go as far as the malicious servant who actively abuses and beats other people, but he's worse than the third servant, the ignorant servant, who didn't know. The negligent servant knew. He knew his master's will, but he didn't do it. The ignorant servant didn't know his master's will, but he still did what was wrong and got away with it. Well, he didn't get away. He got a light beating. Whereas the negligent servant got a severe beating and the malicious servant got cut to pieces. Yeah. I think the negligent servant might be even the most applicable to many of us. Yeah. Because cause most of us in the room, we know the gospel. Perhaps everyone here, even just by virtue of being here today, you, you've heard the gospel. It's not as if we can claim complete ignorance. I, didn't, I had no idea that Jesus was coming or who he was we do have some sense of what Jesus is calling us to do. But let's be honest with ourselves. We often postpone or we delay obedience. We, don't, we think it's not disobedience. It's just like we, we, we'll get to it. It's maybe spiritual procrastination, you could call it. And I think maybe it's subconscious, but subconsciously maybe we say in our hearts, my master is delaying in his coming. And friends, we need to be very, very careful with delayed obedience. Don't think you'll get serious with Jesus later on in life, at some point, maybe when you need to take more responsibility. Once you're married, maybe when you have kids, okay, you'll be responsible then. Don't think you'll change your sexual behaviors or addictions later on. Don't think you'll be generous once you get through this financially tight period or once your business gets going or you become established in your career. Don't think you will have time one day to serve in church once you finish your studies or once your business startup gets, gets off the ground or once your work calms down or once your children move out of home or once you retire, then you'll have more time. Be very careful with delayed obedience because delayed obedience is disobedience and it's really dangerous. It's dangerous because something happens in your heart when you do it. We harden our hearts. Hebrews says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. What happens when you don't obey? What happens when you harden your heart? Your heart gets hard. Think about what I'm saying, because there's a process here. What happens when you harden your heart? your heart gets hard. And a hard heart is very unlikely to decide to become obedient later on. In fact, it's going to be harder to be obedient because your heart has become hard. And we know this, once we've done something disobedient once, twice, three times, it's much easier to do again. It becomes harder and harder to be obedient. So we have to be super careful with delayed obedience, thinking like at a later time, we will deal with this thing we might wind up like the negligent servant who never got around to obedience and whose destiny was a severe beating. So getting back to Peter's question about who the parable applies to, Jesus effectively says, don't worry about them, what about you? Will you be the faithful servant? And yet the parable does apply to everyone. It applies to all of us both the rewards and the punishments are proportional to what we've received. So wherever you are, whatever your gifts, whatever your time, your talents, your treasure, it applies to you in proportion, both the reward and the punishment. Because, and this is super scary for Christians, for us here today, I find this very scary because the more we've learned, the more we've been given, the more we know the gospel, the more leadership we have, the more we will be held accountable. So let's summarize so far. We've seen the first implication of seeking the kingdom. The first implication of seeking treasures in heaven was to be ready. The second implication is to be waiting actively, serving faithfully in God's household. And the third implication that we're gonna see next is that building treasures in heaven will come at a cost now. Yeah. It's, building treasures in heaven will come at a cost now. Look with me at verses 49 to 53. We've already seen 
hear how Jesus explains the timelines, how he will come to bring the fire of judgment as the son of man, but first he must go and be baptized with a sacrificial death. And then he goes on to explain that for us as well, there's going to be a time of struggle before that day comes when he establishes his kingdom. Even for us, there's gonna be this time of struggle, and, it, and the time will bring division, he says, even division within our families. He, read with me again, they will be divided, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. I'm just glad there's no son against mother-in-law and mother-in-law against son. That, I, I, I'm claiming that one. I, I, will, I will take that one. I'm let off the hook. Um, <laughs> anyway, this is, this is actually poetry. I think you can see it's, the font is different, which gives us a clue that this is poetry. Jesus is quoting from the Old Testament book of Micah. And he's doing so, again, to kind of help his audience understand the timelines, to understand what was prophesied, what will happen when. And basically, Jesus is saying that in the current period that we're in, if we're gonna be faithful servants in this time between his first coming and his second coming, if we are going to be proclaiming the gospel and living lives that are different in this time, it will bring division. It will bring division. Of course, we don't want division. We shouldn't unnecessarily un offend people and we sometimes, as Christians, unfortunately, I think we sometimes unnecessarily offend people. But the reality is that the gospel is going to offend at times. It's going to cause uh, division and conflict at times. People, anyone who has, who has converted from Islam to Christianity will know that very well. It divides their families. But even for all of us, I think there's gonna be ways in which it's gonna cause a conflict. It could even just cause like a barrier to intimacy with someone in your family or with a friend. It's sad, it's unfortunate, but it is part of the cost of discipleship. It's part of what we have to give up now to pursue those treasures in heaven. Having said all of this to his disciples, explaining to them about how they must be ready to seek the kingdom, uh, Jesus now turns to the crowd. So all this time he's been, he's been giving this inside info to his disciples, and then he turns to the crowd, and he uses three more illustrations for the crowd to call them also to repentance. And Dory, these ones will go quite quickly. So read with me in verses 54 to 56. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, right away you say a storm is coming, and so it does. And when the south wind is blowing, you say it's gonna be hot, and it is. Hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and of the sky, why don't you know how to interpret this present time? Of course, we have far better weather prediction technologies than they have, uh, so do we know how to interpret the present time? Or are we even greater hypocrites than them? By now, perhaps we, uh, we like the disciples, are, are getting a sense of, un of understanding of what this present time looks like. But Jesus helps the crowds now with an interpretation. He helps them on, like, on how to interpret the present time. And he does it by telling them another little story. Read with me in verses 57 to 59. He, tell, he says, why don't you judge for yourselves what is right? As you are going with your adversary to the ruler, make an effort to settle with him on the way. Then he won't drag you before the judge. The judge hand you over to the bailiff and the bailiff throw you into prison. I tell you, you will never get out of there until you've paid the last penny. So Jesus is saying the present time is like a person who's walking on their way to court, and the person is lucky enough that their adversary is walking with them. So they have this opportunity to try to settle up with their adversary. And all of us would agree it would be much better to try to make right, to make peace, to settle before it's too late, before judgment is handed down. And friends, we are living in the last days. That's the, the biblical term for the period we're in. We're in the last days, and this is the time to make right with God. Yeah. If we understand the times, we have to understand that this is the time to make right with God. Yeah. So that we are ready when the Son of Man comes in judgment. And the great news of the gospel is that there is still time. And we do have an opportunity to make right with God. 
Because before coming in judgment as the Son of Man, Jesus came as a suffering servant. He took our judgment upon himself. So even though we could never repay the debt, we could never do something of our own to make right with our adversary, who is God, we can be made right by trusting in the provision, by trusting in God's rescue plan, which was for Jesus to die on the cross in our place. And perhaps there's someone here today, perhaps several of us today, who have, who have not yet actually gotten right with God. You have not yet believed in Jesus and placed your hope in Him and what He did to rescue you. The good news, the great news is that there is still time. If you want to make sure you're right with God, please come after the service. Come up front and pray with someone. Uh, we're happy to share more with you about what this means. And it just starts with a simple prayer. Today it's possible to make right with God. Jesus then uses one more illustration. And this illustration is actually set up by a question from the crowd. But of course, Jesus in his sovereignty uses the question he gets to drive home the point he's been making. All right, so, so in, in the first five verses of chapter 13, we see that the crowd tell Jesus about some people from Galilee who had been murdered by Pilate. Uh, the same Pilate who, who judged Jesus at the time of his crucifixion, that the same Pilate had murdered some people and to add insult to their deaths, he had mixed their blood with their religious sacrifices. And the question the crowds have is, were those people from Galilee, were those Galileans perhaps worse sinners than everyone else, and that's why they suffered in this way? And Jesus turns their question around on them, on the crowd. Much like when Peter asked the question, he turned it around on Peter and said, what about you? Um, here he says, no, those Galileans were not more sinful than other Galileans. No, I tell you, unless you repent, you will all perish as well. I don't worry about who was more sinful. What about you? Are, you? are you repenting? And he reinforces the point by referring to another recent uh, tragedy that they may have been aware of. Uh, he says, what about those 18 people that the tower in Siloam fell on and killed? Do you think they were more sinful than all the other people in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, unless you repent, you will all perish as well. John Piper, in, in, his, in this great little book, Coronavirus and Christ, I don't know if maybe some of you have it. We actually handed some of them out at Rooted um, during the pandemic. He, he cut this off onto the shelves very fast. Um, but he discusses uh, the passage about, this passage about the Tower of Siloam in relation to the pandemic. And he says this. He says, Jesus' answer is amazing. He draws a meaning from these disasters that relates to everyone. God has a merciful message in all such disasters. The message is that we are all sinners bound for destruction, and disasters are a gracious summons from God to repent and be saved while there is still time. I think that's God's message for the world in this coronavirus outbreak. He's calling the world to repentance while there's still time. That's John Piper. And so as we conclude, and as, as the band comes up, I want to encourage us not to miss the point of the pandemic. It was a wake-up call. It was a gracious call to repent. And as we emerge out of the pandemic, let's correctly interpret the times. We should reevaluate our lives, our priorities, our relationships. But let's make sure that we reevaluate by correctly understanding the times. Not by worrying more about tomorrow, making sure we have a backup plan for the here and now, for the next global disaster that comes, but being more concerned with the fast approaching day of the Lord. And as we wrap up this sermon series and we move on with our post-pandemic 21st century lives, what will become of post-pandemic you and post-pandemic me? Will we repent? Will we be faithful servants, storing up treasures in heaven? Are we ready for the next real big thing? Let's stand together and, and close in prayer. Father God, we, we thank you today that you have not left us in the dark, that you've not left us without any understanding of the times we live in. 
or without being warned of what's to come. And so, Father, I pray that as we hear your word today, we'd find soft hearts. I pray for my heart and that everyone's heart here today would respond with faith, that we'd believe your words, and that we would, based on that certainty and belief that you're coming, that we would live lives of faithfulness. God, help us to know for sure that even though we can't yet see the kingdom, that we don't yet see or feel the treasure that is in store for us, that it's real. Help us to know that you are coming again, that you're coming soon and that you will rescue your people, uh, that you will bring judgment. Help us to believe that and to know what that means. And help us in the meantime, while we wait, Lord, help us to serve faithfully. Help us to love each other and to do so in the light of your soon coming. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.